Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here are your hosts, John Joseph Adams and David Barr Kirtley. Hi, this is Dave. And this is John. And welcome to episode 86 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Rick Yancey, author of popular young adult novels such as the Alfred Kropp series and the Monstrumologist series. His latest book, The Fifth Wave, is the story of a teenage girl searching for her brother in the wake of a devastating alien attack. The book's publisher, Penguin, is betting big that The Fifth Wave has what it takes to become the next Hunger Games and is giving the book a massive $750,000 marketing push. The Fifth Wave has also been optioned for film by Sony Pictures, with Tobey Maguire reportedly attached to the project. Then stick around after the interview as we discuss the current state of science fiction podcasting with author and podcaster Mer Lafferty. All right, so let's get to our interview. All right, so we're here with Rick Yancey. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Okay, so first of all, just tell us about your new book, The Fifth Wave. What's it about? The Fifth Wave is a story that takes the alien invasion genre and uh, leaps from the premise that uh, Hollywood has gotten it completely wrong, that if they're out there, uh, we'd better hope that they never find us. And it centers around four survivors of the alien apocalypse that comes about in uh, waves. Instead of one single attack, there it's a coordinated multiple assault on the planet Earth. The first wave knocks out all electronics, all power. The entire grid goes down. Uh, the second wave is designed to take advantage of the fact that the Earth has an unstable surface and that 40% of the world's population lives within 60 miles of a coastline. The third wave is a plague delivered by birds. And the fourth wave is, well, I'll leave the fourth and fifth waves <laughs> out there. I don't want to do any spoilers, but it's a species threatening event, which, you know, that was what really sparked my imagination with this book. I had run across actually a interview with um, the physicist Stephen Hawking. And in the interview, they had brought up the, you know, what they always love to ask astrophysicists, you know, do you think life is out there in the universe? And he said, of course. And the interviewer asked, well, do you think it could have intelligent life that could somehow bridge the enormous gulfs between star systems? And he said, sure, of course, it's conceivable if they're out there and they've advanced to the point they could. And, of course, the next logical question was, well, what do you think would happen if they found us? And he said, I'm not sure, but I hope they don't, because if they do, it probably won't work out very well for us. It'll probably be more like, you know, when Christopher Columbus came to the Americas, and we all know how that worked out for the Native Americans. <laughs> did, your, did your wife say something that inspired it, too? I thought I read that. Yeah, she did. Um, it was like one of those 3 a.m. conversations where, you know, your mind just starts going. And I asked her just on the spur of the moment, I said, what is your greatest fear? And she said, without hesitation, she said, alien abduction, which was the last thing I thought she might <laughs> say. I thought she was going to say something about the kids, or, you know, her own health or something. And I said, an alien abduction. I said, well, I, I think the odds of that are probably pretty slim, but why is that so scary? And she said, well, not only would it be horrifying to be abducted by aliens, but no one would believe me afterwards. You know, that sense of terrible isolation that that would create, that you'd just be considered crazy. And the, and the novel, you know, kind of takes that feeling. Um, it opens with the, the, the lead narrator, uh, Cassie, who's a 16-year-old girl, utterly alone in the wilderness after having witnessed this terrible devastation uh, brought about by these beings that no one has even seen which I think adds to the fear of the book. I mean, you don't even know what these things even look like. I mean, you mentioned that this was sort of a reaction to Hollywood movies. Could you say what it is about Hollywood movies that... Well, <laughs> we've all seen it, you know? I mean, from War of the Worlds to Independence Day, they come, you know, they wreak some havoc. We all band together. You know, we take them on. And I think that's the, you know, in that sense, that's how Hollywood has gone it wrong. And, you know, it depends on your definition of wrong. Obviously, the movies don't celebrate how tough and bad the aliens are. They're celebrating how tough and bad us humans are. 
But, you know, screenwriters are kind of, you know, it's almost like painting yourself into a corner, you know. You want those thrills of us taking on, you know, the big bad aliens, but you got to figure out some way, you know, that we somehow defeat them. That's your challenge because no movie audience wants to go and watch, you know, two hours of the human race being Hmm. obliterated. Well, so how did you come up with your alien attack plan? Uh, I mean, how did you decide on those specific waves and were there any other ones that you considered but didn't use? Um, it was basically uh, trying to think like an alien and considering the fact that if they are out there, they probably wouldn't attack without getting to know us very, very well. They would learn, like I say in the book, they would learn how we think. They would learn about, you know, what do humans do in times of crisis, and they would turn that to their own advantage. So when I was working through, you know, how the attacks might work, I realized first it, it couldn't just be one attack. The world's too big. You'd have to do it in stages or waves, like I call it in the book. So the first wave would be to cut everybody off, to take down the grid or to, you know, take away our technology, which would isolate people and play to our sort of our primal fears of the dark and of being isolated and alone and kind of drive us together. The second wave, you know, takes advantage of the Earth's actual structure or makeup. The fact that the surface of the Earth was made up of tectonic plates that meet each other and rub against each other and create friction. And that's where we get earthquakes and tsunamis and the idea that it wouldn't take, you know, advanced alien technology to take advantage of this structural flaw, if you will, in in the planet. So these massive earthquakes, huge tsunamis, and you have 40% of the world's population living within 60 miles of a coastline. After an attack like that, the survivors would probably flee inland where they would have no choice if they wanted to survive and even cluster even tighter. And that's when it occurred to me that once you have all that human population, basically one spot, you can unleash, you know, something biological, turn to biological means, which would preserve the planet. You know, you wouldn't have the ray guns and the land walkers and the flying saucers swooping out of the sky. You wouldn't need to just find a way to deliver a virus that has an extremely high kill rate, which you could have plenty of time to genetically engineer in the safety of your mothership. The fourth and fifth waves kind of um, play off the idea of, you know, what would these beings actually look like? Does it matter what they look like? (laughs) They've had plenty of time to decide, you know, how they're going to take care of any of the remnants that are left after they've knocked off 99 plus some change percentage of the earth. I mean, you mentioned that you're kind of reluctant to talk about what the fourth and fifth waves actually are. And I've even seen some, you know, synopses that I thought were kind of spoilerish. I mean, given that the book is so based around mysteries, how do you even go about doing publicity for it? It's difficult. You do kind of have to dance around it. There are, you know, there are major, uh, I guess, spoilers, if you will, that if you go on too long about the basic plot, you're going to give stuff away that's going to, I think, take some enjoyment away from the reader. Well, we can't talk a bit about the characters, I guess. Uh, you mentioned that the main protagonist is a teenage girl named Cassie. Why don't you tell us about her? Um, Cassie is the first female character I've ever attempted. And I was a little nervous, though, tackling her character because, you know, I'm not a 16-year-old girl. I never have been. <laughs> <laughs> I have, you know, three boys, so I didn't raise a 16-year-old. I mean, I didn't raise a girl. So um, I was a little trepidatious, but uh, I knew once I was, you know, just a few pages in that uh, I I had it pretty close. So it was exciting to kind of see the world through the eyes of someone, you know, very different than what I was. The heart of the book really is not an alien invasion, but its effect upon us. Any sort of species threatening or apocalyptic sort of event, how it affects human beings and the idea of when everything else has been stripped away, what, what is it that's fundamental that remains? And to explore that is is why I introduced her little brother, Sam, who's five years old at the beginning of the story and who is separated from her. And it becomes Cassie's sole mission in life to find him and keep a promise that she made to him that she would come back for him and they would be reunited. And that is the driving force of the story more than... You know, are the aliens going to ultimately win? Are we ultimately going to defeat them? It's really a very human story about what is left after everything else is gone. Well, you said in the afterword that your son Jake helps 
out with writing from a teenage perspective? Can you think of anything specific that he, any pointers he gave you? Oh, yes. Um, I, I try to be pretty conservative when it comes to uh, slang, particularly teenage slang, because it changes almost like on a weekly basis. So you don't want to, you know, pepper your, your story with a bunch of teenage slang because, you know, five years from now, it'd be like, teenagers won't even know what's going on. Hmm. Um, so I try to be, you know, kind of conservative about it and very choosy about it. But there was one moment when I was writing and I um, shouted up the stairs to Jake, my 16 year old. I said, I need some term that means someone's really good at something, that they're just excellent. He said, boss, they're boss. I said, oh, that's perfect. <laughs> so that made it to the book. Yeah. OK, one thing I thought was really interesting is one of the characters in the book proposes knocking out the alien mothership using Fermi's steam cannon. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, where did you come across that? And... I don't remember. Okay. You know, I do, I do a lot of research and I just, you know, I probably saw it on some, you know, some, some place online. I did do some, uh, just a little dipping into Fermi because, you know, he's the father of the Fermi paradox, which I don't know if you're familiar with that. But um, basically the Fermi paradox is, okay, there are certainly enough stars in the part of the universe that we can see which could sustain planets, which could, uh, which plants with which intelligent life could arise. And the universe is definitely old enough to have a civilization that's far in advance of ours. And if that is the case, then why haven't we ever seen any evidence of any kind of that anywhere? And that's Fermi's paradox. If they are out there, then why haven't we seen them? We should be able to see them because the There'd be so many. There'd be so much of it out there, but we don't see anything out there. Well, maybe they all got killed with Fermi's steam cannon. <laughs> right, exactly. So, yeah, that, that whole thing with the steam cannon I stumbled across while I was looking into Fermi's paradox. Do you want to just describe what, what the idea is of the steam cannon? Yeah, basically, you um, dig a big hole, you put a nuclear device in the bottom of it, and then you seal it off with steel or concrete or a, maybe both uh, submerged in water. And when the device goes off, of course, you're talking about, what is it, millions of degrees Celsius, which would blow off the, the lid you've constructed of you know, metal and concrete, and it would literally blow it into orbit. It'd be that much force. Okay, so uh, another thing I really liked was... Um... On page 67, there's a reference to, quote, the sole atheist in Camp Ashpit's foxhole, a college professor named Dawkins. <laughs> you caught that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, presumably that's not to Richard Dawkins. Uh, could you just talk about why you decided yeah. to name the character that? This is an action-adventure novel, basically, that's set in sort of a sci-fi paradigm. And, I, you know, I was never pretend I was writing some, you know, great study of good and evil and, you know, the, the, that kind of thing. But I did realize, putting myself in the position of these characters, this, you know, and, and like in any existential crisis, there is this question that arises, what about God? What about God? And this kind of comes up, you know, not, it's not heavy handed, it doesn't come up over and over in the novel, but, you know, every character wonders about this, because I think everyone would wonder about this, what about God? So I didn't try to, you know, play it up too much, but obviously, you know, just like people divide into camps over all kinds of things, I think there would be people who were so entrenched in their own beliefs, whether it be atheistic or monotheistic, you know, they, they would cling even harder. They would dig the trench even deeper. I like it as a reader, especially when you're reading YA, when you know the author has put things in that probably will go over the young person's head, but a savvy reader is going to hook on it and get maybe a chuckle. So. I thought, well, if I want some guy who's an atheist, why not use a name that might ring a bell? <laughs> <laughs> and I understand that this book is the first in a trilogy. Yes, that's right. Uh, second book's coming out in uh, uh, May, May of next year. I mean, it's, you said like the, essentially the premise of the book is that any aliens that could fly here from another star are so advanced that we would have no chance against them. Yeah, it would be like, you know, using sticks and stones against, you know, a tank. <laughs> but it, it seems that makes it kind of a challenge to make it a series like is there anything you can say right. about your approach to that that's not giving too much away or uh yeah my approach is you know maybe it's not so much about watching the mothership crash to earth like in you know independence day maybe it's more like uh what faulkner called you know enduring 
that that is the most most human, if you will, most inspiring thing about our species is that somehow we endure. So I'm not sure there'll be an ultimate triumph. I'm not saying that. There could be. I don't want to, you know, close every door, but uh, there will be affirmation. So which uh, like previous alien invasion stories do you think are, are, have done the best job of uh, presenting a, a realistic picture of it? Oh, gosh. I, gosh. Now I'm drawing a blank. I'm sure there are, you know, plenty of them out there, some that, you know, have been written fairly recently that I should have read. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll say, actually, I mean, the books that this made me think of uh, were The White Mountains by John Christopher. And... Oh, gosh, I'm glad you brought that up. I love that. I, when I discovered that book, how old is that? Was that written back in the 80s or something? Or yeah, or even, even earlier, possibly. I think even earlier, because I remember being pretty young. I mean, and I just, I was blown away by those books. They were so creepy hmm. and yet so, you know, it was, that's just what, it's like dreamlike. It was like so well done. I don't know how well those books ever did, but I sure remember them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card was another one that... Uh... Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, which that uh, coming out soon, the film, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, this year. Did you do any research for any of the, like the uh, military training or weapons? Or... Oh, yeah, a lot of research, yeah, because I am not in the military, nor do I have a, a living family member that served in the military. My father served, but he's passed away, so I couldn't, you know, rely on him as a resource. The best, most fun thing I did that gave me the most insight was, you know, looking at message boards and forums that are actually populated by former and current, you know, military personnel and reading their stories and the jokes they exchange and and how it actually, you know, how boot camp was because a section of my book does deal with military training. Uh, former grunts were talking about the, the drill sergeants that they had exchanging, you know, stories and anecdotes and things that the drill sergeants would scream at them, hmm. you know, how they were treated, that sort of thing. I actually got a lot of information from um, the official side of the United States Marine Corps. In fact, there was a page on there that talked about, you know, the typical day of boot camp. I guess it was to let prospective recruits know, you know, what to look forward to. <laughs> when they got to camp. So that was very helpful. All right, cool. And so the fifth wave I saw has been optioned for film by Sony Pictures. Uh, what's the current status of that? Um, I was informed by my agent yesterday that uh, I'm contractually obligated not to talk too much about the specifics of things. Um, I do know that uh, the, the, I can tell you that the last I heard is that uh, they're lining up a, a screenwriter for the project. Wait, so your agent only yesterday told you that you're not supposed to talk about it? <laughs> yes. Not because he knew I was going to talk to you or anything. Uh, there was a review that um, Entertainment Weekly went online with. It's going to be in their print edition uh, tomorrow. But uh, the review has a sidebar that talks about it being optioned by um, Graham King and Toby McGuire. And uh, after he saw that article, my agent contacted me and said, I don't know if you told Entertainment Weekly this, but, you know, you're contractually obligated not to talk too much about the details of this deal that you have. And I said, I don't tell anybody. I said, I I particularly don't talk to reviewers. Why would I do that? (laughs) So, uh, you know, the galley that we got, it mentions that this book is getting a $750,000 marketing campaign. Uh, Can you believe that? (laughs) It's unbelievable. (laughs) Like, what, What are they, like, when they're spending... That kind of money, like, what does that marketing campaign consist of? Like, what are some of the biggest publicity items that have been going on? Oh, gosh. Well, they uh, have done four book trailers, each one dealing with the first four waves of the attacks, and then premiered them on, you know, pretty heavily trafficked sites like um, MTV, USA Today, io9, and then subsequently put them on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, a lot of extra poster and and banner advertising. The trailers themselves are going to be shown in movie theaters. I did see that they they will be showing the book trailer for showings of Man of Steel. That's one of the, I know, venues that they're going to be doing it on. Hmm. Um, Of course, the money for touring, a lot of advertising in print and other media. There'll be a full-page spread in the New York Times uh, on Tuesday on publication day. But so there's not going to be like a gold-plated elephant parade or anything? Because I, I was thinking if <laughs> no, I was there should be. I think that's a great idea. 
Because I'm just saying, I'm just saying, if I were spending seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, I would want a gold plated elephant parade as you know, part of the deal. Some some drop, you know, like some propaganda drops out of planes, you know, <laughs> just drop leaflets, that sort of thing. I've been, you know, if I can't say, I mean, I've worked with you know half a dozen publishers, and I have never had this experience with one where everyone from the publisher himself down to you know the editorial assistant are so excited about a book. I mean, it's very exciting, and it's also you know, very humbling because, you know, as the person who wrote it, I know all its flaws. It's kind of like being a parent, hmm. you know, you know, all your kids flaws and you're very proud of them. But, you know, if you're an honest parent, you don't look at them with rose colored glasses. So I know, you know, all the flaws of the book. And I know that, you know, there'll be some very conscientious reviewers and critics who are going to see those very flaws and probably won't be able to resist in pointing them out. <laughs> <laughs> but you just have to be prepared for that. You know, it's just, Something that happens. So uh, at one point in the book, Cassie ends up on the farm of a teenage boy named Evan Walker. And I read that you actually grew up on a farm yourself. So was it similar to the one in the book? No, actually, uh, I worked at a cattle ranch, which, which is different from a farm. My, my vision for, for what Evan's farm is, is, first of all, it's in the Ohio Valley. And my ranch that I worked at was in the heart of central Florida in an area called the Green Swamp. So you can, you know. Take it from there, what that was like. Um, but ranch work is a lot different than farm work. But I do know what it's like to, you know, put in a day of back-breaking labor and that sort of thing and working with livestock. Okay, but you didn't grow up on that ranch. It, that was later. No, no. See, my father, was a, he was a lawyer, but he liked to think of himself as like a gentleman rancher. So as soon as we had a little bit of money, he bought this cattle ranch out in the middle of nowhere in a swamp cleared the land and then, you know, trucked in some cattle and then called himself a rancher. And I saw that you wrote your first book at the age of 14. Yes, it was terrible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the experience wasn't terrible, and that's probably why I'm still writing, but the actual book, you know, I wanted to see the light of day. But, you know, it was, I was really, into, I was really a geek. I was in science fiction and fantasy and, you know, so it turned out to be an intergalactic story between, you know, elves and dwarves, which was kind of a weird mashup. Well, and your mom said it was a waste of paper, right? Like your dad wanted you to be a lawyer, right? That your parents were not oh, yes. in interested in you going into novels. No, my father had that, you know, he had that uh, kind of outlook on the arts that, yes, they were necessary, but that would be a horrible way to try to make a living and support a family because until you reach, you know, a certain level, it's not exactly a stable thing to do. You <laughs> And he was a firm believer, and he had been through the Depression, you know, and he was a firm believer in, you know, not taking unnecessary risks. I'm not saying that he wasn't, you know, entirely supportive, but I think he would have been, you know, perfectly happy with me becoming a lawyer. Well, but so you ended up actually going to work for the IRS, right? Yes, I did, for 12 years. It was one of those things where I picked up a newspaper one day, and I was looking for a job. And uh, I saw this ad in the paper, didn't even identify that it was for a job at the IRS. It just said, you know, federal government work. All you have to have is a college degree and be breathing. <laughs> <laughs> Come on in for this open house and find out what it's all about. And then I showed up for the open house and realized at that point I was inside the bowels of the IRS. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I thought when I took the job, I thought, oh, this will, you know, I was writing at the time. I thought, well, I need something to pay the bills, and I'll just hang on to this until my writing kind of takes off, and or I actually get off my butt and you know get a master's degree in English, maybe teach somewhere, and um, then you know, twelve years later, I was still there. Well, but you wrote a book about it called uh, Confessions of a Tax Collector, so you must have had some sort of interesting experiences, right? Oh yes. I mean, I'm. Uh, in fact, I was just talking to my wife about it just uh, a couple of days ago. You know that. You know, I would not be the person that I am, and I'm not even sure that I would have the willpower or wherewithal or whatever you want to call it. This is something that goes, you know, is regardless of talent, by the way, you know, to, to actually have the discipline to finish a novel. Because that's one of the things the IRS gave me was this, um, it awakened my will to succeed, I guess you would say, you know, to finish whatever it is, no matter how unpleasant it might become. I mean, there's still moments when I'm writing a book when I just want to, you know, take my computer throw it out the window and, and, you know, go get a job I don't know, selling insurance or something. And I tell myself it has to be easier than this. But uh, that's one of the, the gifts that the IRS gave me. Plus the fact that I met my wife there. So, you know, it all works out in the end. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you, can you think of any specific uh, interesting stories from your time there? 
I could, but the IRS would shoot me if I touched. <laughs> no, there's, you know, <laughs> you know, on a daily basis, you were exposed to, you know, the farcical, the tragic, the hilarious, the, you know, the surreal. You know, I specialize in a particular kind of collection with the IRS, and that was from people who had basically decided for whatever underlying motivation that they were never going to pay taxes again. You know, sometimes it was based on a rationalization or a fantasy that they could somehow opt out of the tax system or it didn't apply to them for some reason or another. And they were pretty, you know, you know, at times sneaky, at times, you know, kind of dangerous types. And that was kind of what um, was addicting about what I was doing because it was like a cat and mouse. It was like a chase. It was like a constant chase. I remember, you know, one case, uh, a guy was a pretty hardcore, we called them tax protesters. That was the official term for them. We had other terms <laughs> within the office, but um, uh, who had, you know, thumbed his nose and, and um, was actually kind of dumb enough to park his collectible 69 cherry red Corvette in a public parking space. I found the car after some work and called in the tow trucks. He saw me. He came barreling out of his office and um, he did end up spitting on me and shoving me, but you know, that just always came with the territory. I was very excited about that car. I was going to sell it. You know, that's what the IRS does with seized assets. I was very excited about my sale because it was like the coolest thing I had ever seized. I don't know if you've, you know, Roger Zelazny is my favorite author. And he, before he became a full-time writer, he worked for the Social Security Administration. And I was just rereading re one of his books, and I, and I noticed there's this line in there where uh, someone seems to have an awful lot of information about the protagonist. And she says that she knows all this stuff about him because she's been reading government reports on him. And he says, I'd, I'd be really curious to meet the person who's writing these reports. There may be some great artistic talent going to waste in a government office. <laughs> and, uh, I've always thought that was a little uh, you know, in-joke to his time and you know, working in the government. Yeah, that's what, you know, I tell people, it's like, it wasn't like I was, a you know, an IRS person that turned to writing. I was always a writer that was working at the IRS trying to figure out a way out. Uh -huh. Well, so so what was your way out? How did, how did you turn to writing then? Well, I, you know, I had published my first novel uh, with Simon & Schuster and, um, you know, realized very quickly on that first novels, they don't, <laughs> <laughs> unless you're incredibly lucky, they don't, you know, they won't let you quit your job, that's for sure. And I wanted to continue writing, you know, I mean, the, the, just getting that first novel published had, had kind of swept away my initial, you know, reluctance or whatever you want to call it about ever becoming a, a full-time professional writer that I had proved to myself that it was something that I was actually capable of doing was, you know, completing a manuscript and seeing it through, a, through publication with a major publisher. So I happened to read a, a book not long after that was published called Monster by John Gregory Dunn. Uh, he's the, um, or he was the spouse of Joan Didion and, uh, he worked in Hollywood and he had written a book about a movie that he worked on and the inner workings of how the Hollywood studio system worked at the time. And, uh, I thought this book monster, I thought, you know what? No one has ever written a book about, you know, what it's like to work within the most hated agency on the planet. And, I realized the moment I started thinking about that idea of actually writing a memoir based on my experiences that I couldn't stay at that job. <laughs> <laughs> the IRS wouldn't look kindly upon an employee, you know, writing some tell all book about how things really were behind the frosted glass doors. So I knew once that uh, uh, I had done the proposal for the book that uh, that what that meant was it was a career ending decision. Also a career beginning decision, but, you know, after that, this was 10 years ago, you know, after that, it was kind of just a leap. Well, but so how did you get into doing the YA books then? That was accidental, totally accidental. I had written a novel starring a 30-something-year-old detective, Private Eye, who is kind of a, a klutz and a, a ne'er-do-well, and his mom dies and leaves him some money, so he decides to fulfill his lifelong dream of being a detective without having any clue about how to be a detective. <laughs> so like me joining the IRS, but he um, he sets up his shingle, and his first client pays him a bunch of money to take something that the client claims was his that was stolen from him, actually, and he just wants this detective to get it back for him. 
Um, it turns out it's a very special kind of item, priceless in its way. Uh, and it also happens to be magical. It's King Arthur's sword Excalibur. And the rest of the book is the detective discovering that his client was actually the bad guy and the bad guy has designs to use the sword Excalibur for his own nefarious purposes. And the, you know, the last third of the book is, you know, getting it back and the CIA gets involved and it's, you know, a lot of shootouts and stuff. And publishers really liked that manuscript. I mean, there were, you know, there's a half a dozen or more that really liked that book. They thought it was so different, not a box, but that was also its downfall because everything spins off of marketing. They had concerns that, you know, they didn't know what genre it fit in because it literally didn't fit into a genre. It wasn't detective because of the magical sword. It wasn't fantasy because it's set in the 20th century. It's not, you know, the CIA gets involved, but it's not really a spy thriller because you got, you know, the first part of the book is, you know, detective fiction, then it becomes something, and then it becomes something else. And also, it's just a big mashup. And they said, you know, our marketing department would kill us because they wouldn't be able to tell the bookseller where to put it on the shelf. Then my agent, who, you know, really believed in the manuscript and believed in the story, came to me and said, you know what? There is one area of fiction that the rules don't apply. It's YA. It's young adult because kids aren't so set in their ways yet. They don't care as long as you give them a good story. And I said, well, there's, you know, beyond the kind of fantasy element, what is that about my story? That's YA. I mean, my protagonist is 30 something mm -hmm. years old. He said, well, just take your protagonist and half his age, make him 15, make him a kid, because that's, you, that's really the, you know, the hub of what makes YA YA is having a young protagonist. And at first I resisted, but then I decided to give it a try. And, uh, that resulted in my first YA novel. I did change it and rewrote the story from his point of view, from a 15 year old's point of view, and the book sold right away. So, and what, what, what happened? What, what, and what's it's called? The Extraordinary Adventures of Alfred Crop. I actually heard you, you told kind of a funny story about coming up with the name Alfred Crop. Could you talk about that? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I didn't have a name for him. I didn't want to use the same name I used for my detective character because. You know, to an author, names are extremely important, and it's almost like naming your kid, and then you have to change their name when their kid reaches 30 years old. That'd be weird. So I decided to have a whole new name. I decided on the first name, Alfred, because it was close to author, and it's an Arthurian sort of story, but I couldn't figure out the last name, and what had actually happened was my coffee machine broke, and I went to Walmart, and I was walking down the coffee aisle, and I saw Krupp's coffee, and... I thought, oh, that sounds so cool, and it's almost perfect for my character for to kind of describe him, because he's kind of this big, goofy guy. I wanted kind of a goofy name, uh, but I decided to change it because I didn't want to get sued by Krupps, and uh, so I made it, long story short, Alfred Krupp. Oh, well, no, I'm curious. I'm, curious. I, I'm interested in the long story, though, because you found it. <laughs> I bet you are. Okay, so <laughs> I made his name Alfred Krupp. I just took off the S off of Krupps and made it and added the P and made a K R U P P. And we were um, very close to publication. I mean, I, I forget exactly how the timing was working, but it was extremely close to publication. When my editor called me, she was all in a panic and she was like, don't you Google names before you write a book? And I, I don't know what you're talking about. And she said, it's his name. It's Alfred's name. We're going to have to change it. And we got to change it quickly because, you know, we're right at the wire here when we're going to go to press. And I said, well, why? And she said, because Alfred Krupp is a real person. And I was totally shocked. I said, well, I had no idea. I, I, you know, who, who's, <laughs> who would be named Alfred Krupp? Actually, there are real Alfred Krupps walking around, but that wasn't the Alfred Krupp she was referring to. And she said, well, Alfred Krupp was a real person uh, who lived in Germany. He was the owner of uh, Krupp Manufacturing, which was instrumental in, in producing a lot of Hitler's war machine. And she said, you know, I don't want to publish a YA book whose hero is named after a Nazi. So you better come up with something quick, which I ended up doing. We just took out, you know, the U and put in an O and Alfred was born. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, cause that's like, names are a big problem mm -hmm. for me because often I'll, I'll have a name that I thought I just made up. And then later on, I realized it's just something I heard somewhere. Right. Well, from then on, I always check. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> 
I always say, it's okay that, you know, I mean, you know, there are only so many names in the world and you know, there's a lot of people and everybody has a name and, you know, it could happen that you come up with a name for a character that, you know, several people have that name. It's just don't, you know, make sure they're not a famous person or something like that. Uh, um, and then you have another series called The Monstrumologist. Uh, could you just say briefly what, what the premise of that is? Yes. Um, it springs from a couple of things. My love of 19th century literature and my great fear of things that go bump in the dark that dates back to my childhood. The basic premise is, is that back in the day, back in the 19th century, there's actually a brand, an emerging branch of science that studied and sometimes hunted uh, creatures that we normally would subscribe or, uh, to folklore, creatures of myth. Not creatures like vampires or werewolves or something like that, but things that could actually exist in our physical universe. Creatures that were written about quite seriously and extensively dating back to uh, the time of the ancient Greeks. The first creature that is uh, wreaking havoc in, in the first book is uh, called the Anthropophagi, which is uh, actually a creature that's been written about by Herodotus and Pliny the Elder, and even William Shakespeare makes a mention of them a couple of times, a race of beings um, with no heads and eyes and brain and mouth located at the, you know, different parts of the anatomy. <laughs> I actually believe in these things. And that series now, the, the last book, the fourth book of it will be published this fall by Simon Schuster. Uh-huh. Because I was reading an interview, and, and they, I came across this reference where they said that the series nearly met a premature end back in 2011, but was saved by an extraordinary response from fans. Uh, what's the mm -hmm. story behind that? Uh, my contract was done. I had written, I had a three book contract. Um, I had always had it in my mind though, that, um, it probably the story arc, if you will, cannot be told in its entirety in just three books. So I had my fingers crossed that, you know, the series would have gained enough of a following and enough sales that Simon and Schuster would be delighted to, you know, extend my contract for one more book. And I wrote the third book in the series, the final book, according to the contract, with that hope and thought in mind, because the first two books in the series had gotten a lot of critical uh, attention, as well as some pretty big time awards. The first one received the um, Michael Prince honor from the American Library Association. And the second book, The Curse of the Wendigo, was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize. So I was you know, cautiously optimistic that once I got the third book done, that we'd be able to negotiate a contract for a final book. The other reason I was thinking that is because the way the story was structured, the whole setup is, is I, the writer, Rick Yancey, discovers these 13 leather-bound, handwritten notebooks, a diary, and that's the form that the books take. It's the form of a diary of an old, a very old man looking back on his, his youth and his adventures with this scientist who studies monsters. Um, by the time I reached the third book, I still had three of these hypothetical notebooks left to edit and to publish. And that's how I presented the third book to my publisher. My publisher said, you know, look, Rick, we're very sorry. We, we had high hopes for the series as we're sure you did, but the sales don't really justify us moving forward with one last book. And, um, the Monstermologist is one of those series, you know, there's some books that they don't become hugely popular, but the people who do like it love it, and it becomes almost cult-like. And that was sort of what was churning underneath the surface by the time I had turned the third book in. There were some very fierce, very loyal readers to these books who just had fallen in love with the characters. And, um, you know, they would have been perfectly happy there being 45 books <laughs> in the series, much less just one more. So because I constantly got asked questions about a possible fourth book, I just put on my Facebook fan page, you know, I just heard from the publisher. They will not, you know, they're going to, you know, stop the series now at this, with the publication of the third book. And that's all I said. And the blogosphere and the internet exploded. Hmm. Uh, there was a particular blogger who posted a long entry on her site and said, oh, and by the way, here's how you contact Simon and Schuster. And uh, this is the form you used. Here's the link. Please, everyone needs to let them know that we are not happy that, you know, there will not be a fourth book. And apparently 
Simon & Schuster got enough feedback from readers to convince them, you know what, let's bring the story to a close and let's do a fourth book. So, Wow, great. Okay, and then just the last thing I want to ask you about is that you have a short story called When First We Were Gods that'll be appearing in an anthology called Rag and Bones, edited by Melissa Marr and Tim Pratt. Yeah, that was a that was a great opportunity. Melissa just contacted me out of the blue and she said, Hey, Tim and I are putting together this anthology, Neil Gaiman's gonna be in it, uh Kerry Ryan's gonna be in it, um, Margaret Stoll and Cami Garcia and you know, this is our idea. It was, it was, you know, Neil had mentioned to us, you know, about, you know, the things we read as kids, these fairy tales and folklores that are elders passed down to us how does that affect our writing and does it, does it subconsciously affect us does it consciously affect us and she said you know i know that you know she was familiar with my monster monologist book she says i know you're a lover of 19th century literature and this is the kind of thing we're thinking of would you be interested in taking uh, one of your favorite stories uh, from that era and kind of updating it putting a new twist on it that's the whole concept behind this book and uh i said yeah that'd be cool that'd be great um, I didn't want to find something, you know, I didn't want to use something that, you know, had been overdone. And I, I had remembered something from Hawthorne that at the time I read it when I was pretty young, I think I was a teenager, I thought, gosh, it sounds so familiar. And the reason it did was Hawthorne had written it about 20 years after uh, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. And it's basically kind of a Frankenstein-like story. It's called The Birthmark. And it's about this... Um, scientist type, you know, the 19th century writers were really unnerved by science, <laughs> kind of scare them, um, uh, who uh, falls in love with this woman who's absolutely beautiful, uh, and she has a birthmark on her cheek, and it just starts to bug the guy. It just bugs him. It's like she's so perfect, except she has this one tiny, in his mind, a flaw. She had the birthmark. So he decides to use all his scientific knowledge and uh, acumen to try to remove this birthmark and make her perfect. I won't give away the ending, but you probably could figure being Hawthorne and being the 19th century, it doesn't end out very well. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's over the top in the melodramatics, you know, it's it's a little too much on the nose, it hits you over the head with this point, like a lot of writing from that era, but, you know, I just, that's part of its charm to me. So when I decided to, you know, do as Melissa suggested and, you know, give it that new fresh twist... I kind of kept stepping back from the story away from the particulars like a mad scientist stereotype guy and his weird grotesque sort of assistant and the, and the poor damsel who gets, you know, uh, kind of victimized by the guy's love. And I just kept stepping back for it until finally I was in the future and I was writing, you know, taking the themes of this story and placing them in maybe not the not so distant future where humankind has figured out a, w a way to defeat death, which kind of sprang from an article I had read. I forget where, I think it might've been the New York times magazine. There's some scientist type and, you know, he, he's a theoretical guy, but you know, a lot of it's based on current technology, this idea that we can achieve a sort of virtual immortality by downloading what makes us us into a program where consciousness does not have to end uh, when our body ends. Well, you can take the next step and then say, well, if you can upload yourself, why couldn't you download yourself? Why couldn't you grow bodies? And when your body gets too old and feeble, you can download yourself into a new fresh body. Yeah, so, I mean, in the story, you have uh, the wealthy people are, they're essentially immortal. And yes. it's kind of a marriage between a guy who's, this is his 45th marriage or something, and uh, a woman who's put off getting married 14 yes. times or something like that. Right, um, right. He falls in love with, with um, quote-unquote, immortal, someone who is not in the class that he is and therefore has a mortal life like yours and mine. But yeah, it does kind of take that, you know, the idea of, the birthmark is is actually human death that mars the human face, um, at least from this guy's perspective. And so he's going to remove that terrible flaw of death from his lover by making her immortal like him. But he, you know, it uh, it has some pretty terrible consequences when he tries. You know, part of what makes life precious is the fact that time is precious, and that's pointed out in the story. 
uh, by one of the characters where she says, you know, we've taken time, once the most precious thing on earth, and we've made it the most useless, the most valueless thing. What is time to us anymore? Why do we celebrate birthdays or anniversaries or, you know, no wonder we, we can't stay married and we can't stay in love because we've taken away the the finiteness of life and filled the infinite with just emptiness. Well, but I mean, do you think that, I mean, how, how long do you think a life has to be before you get to that point of, it just it all comes to the same point. I mean, say you could live to be 200 years old or 300 years old. Would that be too long? Or I mean, well, I guess, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, it depends on what you're up to. You know, I would hope that, you know, if you had some kind of gifts like that, that you would, you know, make the most of it and not spend your time, you know, watching the prices, right. You know, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm certain, and I'm certain that, you know, ask me this question again when I'm 80 years old. I mean, you may get a completely different answer. You know, sometimes I, I have a feeling or a sensation that I've been around forever and I'm kind of tired. And then I have a sensation like I just got here, you know, like my, you know, my life's just starting and, and how could it be that I'm this age and I only have, you know, you know, I'm on the back end of, you know, the time I have allotted, you know, how, how could something like that happen? <laughs> Um, and also, I mean, I saw that the story was optioned for film by Lionsgate. Is there anything you can say about that? Uh, a writer director duo that's, uh, that Lionsgate's very up on, they like them a lot and they want to bring these guys young to a couple of young guys. Um, one's, one's a screenwriter and one's a director who's gotten some notice. Um, so they certainly have placed it with a team that they believe in. And I don't think it was my impression. It, it wasn't like, you know, someone was getting thrown a bone just to keep them around. Um, but they do want to bring these guys along and, and they, they really love this story. All right, great. So, uh, I mean, we'll keep an eye out for news about that. Um, so, I mean, that does it for the questions. Is there anything else, uh, to wrap things up that you, any other projects you want to mention or anything else you just wanted to throw out there? No, I think you've, you've got it. You were thorough. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was just going to be the fifth wave. Yeah, that was, that was fun. <laughs> All right, great. So, uh, Rick Yancey, uh, thanks so much for joining us on Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Thanks, David. And that was our interview. So thanks so much to Rick Yancey for joining us on the show. And as we mentioned, for our panel today, we'll be discussing the current state of science fiction podcasting. And we're joined by a special guest geek, Mer Lafferty, host of the podcast I Should Be Writing. She was part of the first generation of podcasters and achieved widespread notice for her podcast novels Heaven and Playing for Keeps. She's also served as editor of the Escape Pod and Pseudopod short fiction podcasts and is the author of the book Tricks of the Podcasting Masters. Her latest novel, The Shambling Guide to New York City, is about a young woman who gets a job writing travel books for monsters. So, Murr, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. And so just to start out with, I just wanted to do a quick run through of some of the other science fiction podcasts that people should know about. And I thought we were going to be able to cover pretty much all of them until I started to actually sit down and write out a list of exactly how many there are. Hmm. And to give you an idea of how many there are, there's a website called worldswithoutend.com. And if you go there and click on resources and then podcasts, they have a list of 66 podcasts. Uh, and those basically only cover mostly book-related podcasts. That's not even covering all the movie and TV-related podcasts. Um, but you can find a, a pretty comprehensive list there. But I would like to just sort of run through some of the main ones that we've spent the most time listening to. So, for example, if you go to our uh, iTunes page and look at the related ones, a bunch of the ones that show up there are like SF Signal, Adventures in Sci-Fi Publishing, the Science Fiction Book Review Podcast, Sword and Laser, Starship Sofa, uh, SFF Audio, and the Dragon Page. Um, other big ones are like Writing Excuses. We had Brandon Sanderson on. Uh, one of our recent episodes, I mentioned Merle Lafferty does the uh, I Should Be Writing podcast is one of the big ones. So uh, I don't know, do you guys have thoughts on any of those or like what are the what are the pod science fiction podcasts that you spend the most time listening to? Uh, well, when I'm listening to podcasts, uh, more often than not, I'm listening to one of the fiction podcasts, which, uh, you know, we haven't listed those off yet. But um, when it comes to the sort of nonfiction type podcast you were saying, like the book, the, the podcast about science fiction. Um, I like the Dragon Page, um, although I, I haven't listened to it much uh, recently. Um, I like uh, the Squeecast. Uh, I'm actually going to be on the Squeecast some at some episode uh, that's airing in May. Uh, if I'm interested in listening to some sort of 
criticism of science fiction, like hardcore sort of literary type criticism, uh, I'll listen to the Code Street podcast, which uh, is hosted by Jonathan Strawn and Gary Wolf. Uh, Jonathan Strawn's another anthologist uh, w- uh, working in the field, and he also he's also the reviews editor of Locus Magazine. Well, yeah, I mean, you mentioned that there's different categories, right? There's sort of talk interview shows like this one. Then there's the fiction podcasts. There are also podcasts devoted to a particular author or a television show or movie. Um, and then there's comic book podcasts. The only comic book podcast I've really spent a lot of time listening to is Comic Geek Speak. Uh, there's another popular one called Around Comics. And it's actually the Nerdist Industries has uh, one now called Comic Book Club, which I think is really interesting because they actually tape it live in front of a studio audience. They do it at a bar in New York City and have a guest on and, and tape it. I, I really want to check that out sometime. Um, sort of the single author ones would be like the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast, uh, the Tolkien Professor, who we've had on the show, and there's one called The Double Shadow, which is devoted to the works of uh, Clark Ashton Smith. And I think that's just really cool that you can get a whole podcast devoted to a relatively obscure author like that. But you said, John, you mostly listen to fiction podcasts, right? So why don't you talk about uh, just what some of the fiction podcasts are? Sure. Uh, well, you know, my own magazines, Lightspeed and Nightmare, both have a, comp- a podcast component as well. And so, um, uh, but then there's also uh, Escape Pod, you know, which Murr used to edit. And uh, then there's the whole family of, of the Escape Artist podcasts. So there's Escape Pod, which does science fiction. There's Pseudopod, which does horror. And Podcastle, which does fantasy. And, uh, and then there's things like uh, Drabblecast and uh, Clark's World. Uh, and Clark's World is very similar to Lightspeed in the sense that it... Uh, publishes a lot of original fiction and then also podcast stuff. And uh, then Beneath Cecil Skies also does podcasts. Uh, Strange Horizons recently added a podcast to their uh, lineup. Well, yeah, I'll just mention that I've personally had stories on Escape Pod, Pseudopod, uh, the Drabblecast, and I'll mention one that, that's fairly new, the Journey Into Podcast. I've had two stories on there. So, And they actually did they do a lot of some um, full cast recordings, which are pretty cool. So if people want to know where to start, you could you know check out some of my stories. And uh, but Mur, why don't you talk about fiction podcasts? You've been an editor of some of them. Uh, what's your uh, take on the fiction podcasts? Well, obviously, I'm a big fan. Um, Escape Pod started in 2005, and Steve Ely uh, FedExed me brownies <laughs> to ask me to uh, promote and give Escape Pod a listen. Um, it made a lot of people aware of short fiction, and I know that. We're all so into the science fiction community. The idea that people don't understand that short fiction's out there and so accessible is silly, but it is. That that there are people there who just did not know you could find these stories and they listened to it. And I remember a couple of times, this happened several times when Steve was editor, he would mention Asimov's or uh, SNFF, uh, excuse me, Hmm. fantasy and science fiction, excuse me. And the comments on the blog would be like, oh, my God, I never knew those magazines existed. People just don't even know the magazines exist or 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 even like really think about anthologies or anything like people just don't know short stories are out there. That's short stories. Biggest problem is obscurity. And uh, I think Escape Pod did a lot to sort of pave the way for that to become much more mainstream. And, and because it is it really is ideal for like a commute or something. So you can listen to a full single story, um, you know, on your commute to and from work. Well, I mean, you guys are saying that Escape Pod um, made a lot more people aware of magazines like Asimov's and FNSF, and presumably part of your motivation for doing the Lightspeed and Nightmare podcast is to make people aware of those magazines. Do you get much sense that people are listening to the podcast and then going and subscribing to the magazines? Um, that's that's a tough thing to actually figure out. I haven't actually been able to figure out if that is working. I mean, that's at least part of what our plan is, is to, you know, because the podcasts are free. And so, but we do have to spend money producing them. And and actually we have Stefan Rudnicki producing them who, and he's like an Audi and Grammy award winning uh, audiobook producer. And he's narrated tons and tons of uh, audiobooks himself. And uh, so just having him on board, handling all of our production and everything, like he narrates some of the stories, but he also just hires other people to do it sometimes. So, I mean, we're actually putting a fair amount of money into the podcast, whether or not it's actually worth it. It's really hard to say. I kind of see podcasts that are paired with other media as they're usually free. And so I just see them as marketing. I mean, you're going to pay a lot of money to uh, have a billboard on a highway 
and you don't know how many people that billboard influences, but you know how many people drive on the highway every day. And that's always good Mm -hmm. that you know that you're reaching X number of people. And with podcast stats, we can know that. Yeah. And, you know, the the nice thing about uh, the Lightspeed Nightmare podcast is that, I mean, we're, I mean, not the nice thing, but I mean, one of the things that's in our favor is that we only podcast half of the stories that we publish every month. And so ideally, people who like the podcast and they really like my editorial choices, um, they'll be inspired to go then check out the magazine because they want to read the other stories that we didn't podcast. Well, I mean, speaking of podcast stats, let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, we only within the past six months or so started using PodTrack. Uh, that's P-O-D-T-R-A-C to track our downloads, which is really nice. Uh, so, cause we finally, for the first, you know, we've been doing this show for years. We had never had any idea how many people are actually downloading it. Um, do you use PodTrack? Do you use something else, Mer? I'm with Libsyn and they have a pretty good statistics function. So I just go log into Libsyn and see who's downloading what and when and from where. And, and Libsyn is just sort of a full featured podcasting service, sort of. Yes. Yes, it's it's short for liberated syndication, and uh, it's a. It, they came around when those of us who were podcasting with our normal websites were suddenly seeing huge bandwidth drains and get, starting to panic. I posted a blog post called "How many podcast? Uh, how many downloads do geek podcasts get?" Because it's actually it's very hard to know how popular different podcasts are in comparison to each other. Really, the only way I have of knowing basically is to go to the iTunes store and see how many reviews podcasts have and that can can kind of give you a really rough idea but i was actually curious like how many actual downloads are we talking about so what i did is i just typed i googled podcast and downloads per (laughs) and you just come up with examples you know people who posted how many downloads their podcasts get per uh you know per month or whatever and so I, i sort of collated all the information there so if people are curious about that they could you know just google that blog post how many downloads do geek podcasts get I, I emailed that to you, Mer. Did you take a look at that? Did you have any? Uh, I did. What did you think of those numbers? Um, I think they're pretty accurate uh, from what I know of the podcast you mentioned. I think the podcasts that have been around for a while built their audiences slowly. And I say that as a podcast that's been around for a while. But I get about 8,000 listeners through the life of the podcast. Um, it's a lot less than that per month. You know, the Nerdist podcast was reported to be getting 200,000. That was actually a little while ago, so it's probably more than that now. But that seems sure. sort of to be the upper boundary of what a geek-themed podcast could possibly get. Locus sort of reported uh, that Escape Pod... It, it, Escape Pod's the most kind of popular short fiction, yes. science fiction short story podcast. is in sort of the mid-30,000s. The other shows have not grown as much as Escape Pod, but the science fiction fan, it it was their first. And so other people had to move to the other shows if they wanted to follow fantasy or follow horror. And I think that was that's one reason why Escape Pod is larger. But yeah, I, I was actually the contact person when they were gathering those numbers. And I had my assistant editor go in and crunch all the numbers for us and was pretty pleased with the result. It stayed steady for a couple of years and sometimes i despair at plateaus and sometimes i'm just glad it doesn't go down well you mentioned i mean you've been podcasting for a while and you're currently doing uh i should be writing Mm -hmm. and you've done a bunch of other ones previously could you just talk about why you settled on the i should be writing one as your primary outlet um time really my writing career is you know has been sputtering along regularly for several years and it's finally starting to to do something i'm trying to get my trying to get my mfa and i've got my book coming out and the second book to finish and that's when you have to start picking your favorite child (laughs) and that sucks Hmm. but you know i should be writing it's it's weird to say this i it, it makes me feel all uh uh full of myself but i've gotten so many emails from people saying you know, I started writing again because of you. And I have people who were unpublished when they started listening to me. Uh, like, I believe Gail Carriger was a listener. Blake Charlton was a listener. I think Gail still is. And it's humbling and it's awesome. And I realized that people do get something out of it. I do a, a 
premium podcast for my listeners who subscribe uh, monetarily. And that's a little bit more frequent and a little bit more honest because it's locked. And uh, my I started with Geek Fu Action Grip, which was an outlet for my essays. I was writing geeky essays at the time and couldn't get them published. NPR wasn't interested. I couldn't understand why. Hmm. And so I started doing it on this podcast. And because there weren't a lot of podcasts at the time and weren't a lot of geeky podcasts, uh, that's how I started building my listenership. And then I just, I started the, I should be writing in 2005. And then I've done um, video podcasts with my daughter over Christmas time. And I've done a, we did a daily podcast when I worked for Lulu TV. My co-host and I did This Day in Alternate History, where we talked about something that actually happened and then spun it off into really weird areas. And that was a lot of fun. And um, we had to stop that when we lost our jobs because we weren't together every day anymore. And, you know, with the skate pod and pseudopod, unfortunately, it was time. You know, when I when I was looking at the job I was doing, I wasn't satisfied that I was doing my best because I was so torn and, you know, for not only for my own time, but also because the skate pod is so established and so well respected, I had to move on because I didn't want to take it down with me in my spiral of, oh God, I don't have time. Uh -huh. I actually saw on the, just in the last day or so on the iTunes store, another podcast kind of of yours for your, um, the shambling guide to New York City is appeared. Um, what's the story with that? Oh, well, that was, that was very exciting. Orbit agreed to let me podcast the novel for free. You know, we're not going to keep it up forever, but they're letting me do a chapter a week. And we started in May at the beginning of May in order to get people aware of the book coming out at the end of May. And I'll be podcasting it through December. So I recorded the audio book a couple of months ago and then they sent me the files, so I'm just taking a chapter, putting a end cap, end caps on them, and and putting them up there. And I'm very grateful to Orbit for, you know, letting me do this. And I'm very excited to be able to give my listeners my new book because they're the ones who helped me build my career, and I didn't want to have a book out that they didn't have access to. Before we ever started doing a podcast, I'd become just a hardcore podcast addict, and I was listening to dozens and dozens of podcasts and. I developed some very firm ideas about what made a podcast successful because I would sort of comb through the iTunes listings. And I noticed that there were some podcasts that had, you know, they only had 40 episodes or something, but they had thousands of reviews. And then there were other ones that had released thousands of episodes and only had, you know, five or six reviews. And so I really spent a lot of time thinking, okay, well, what is it about, about a podcast that makes it catch on or not? And one thing I really felt is that the, a lot of the podcasts that I, I started listening to and kind of gave up on, they weren't bad. They had a lot of good material, but the good material was sort of drowned out by just kind of like stuff that made me feel like I was wasting time. And so I really felt like when we started doing our own podcast, I was like, I want this podcast to be as much just solid content as I can possibly make it and to just mercilessly edit out anything that, you know, is just chit chat that's not actually interesting in of itself. That's totally true, because if you look at the quick and dirty network that Mignon Fogarty, Grammar Girl, created, she made her Grammar Girl podcast quick and dirty. It's short. And every other podcast she's brought into her network says, you have to be this short and concise. Writing excuses purposely keeps it to 15 minutes or sometimes 18. But Howard Taylor takes the blame for that. <laughs> And he accepts it. I think that some of the longer casts have very, very passionate listeners. They want to listen to two hours of board game talk. I used to love the board game podcast from uh, the Board Game Geek. I used to love that podcast, but I just got tired. I couldn't finish it. So it's like a too big pizza. The pizza's good. It's just I can't finish the whole thing. And um, But I know they had very, very passionate listeners. But I think if you want to have a wider appeal, you got to go shorter. My producer, Patrick Hester, got a job and had his hours to do podcasts came a lot shorter. And I don't record on a very good schedule. 
And so I would often not have any content for him on the days he was able to produce. And so finally I'm like, well, I got to get my listeners something. So I would record a very short, just, Hey guys, this is no production, but this is what I'm thinking about. Here's your podcast. And it was like 10 minutes. People went crazy. I mean, I had people telling me on Twitter, I love this new format. Please keep doing it. And I just thought it was going to be a, a, a short thing while I, got my feet under me and, and was able to podcast the longer ones on a more regular basis. But people kept saying how much they love the short one. So I kept doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this is something we've really struggled with because, I mean, when we first started doing this podcast, we just had trouble coming up with stuff to talk about. And we had a contract to produce hour long episodes. So it was sometimes a struggle to like, oh, what are we going to say to fill up this time? But as we've gotten more comfortable with it and things are going longer and longer. And for a long time, we had just a strict policy, like an hour and a half, no longer than an hour and a half. Absolutely no, no way, no how. But some of the most recent ones, like the conversation has been so good and I don't want to cut it. And I mean, our last episode was two and a half hours long and that's, I cut an hour out of it. I mean, you know, uh, the unedited version was three and a half hours long and, wow. you know, I just don't, I'm not really quite sure what to do because I don't think most people even will download a two and a half hour long podcast, let alone start listening to it. Um, so, you know, I'm like, should we split it up somehow? I mean. Uh, should we split up the interview from the panel? I don't know. But, uh, and it's just like, it's just really hard when there's that much stuff to listen to and edit and collate just to get it done on deadline is becoming really, really hard. So, so something's got to give somewhere. Well, I certainly appreciate all the effort you put into editing the shows. You make me sound so much smarter. I'm, I'm always a little nervous whenever I go on some other podcast because then I know I'm not going to be edited necessarily. And, uh, I have to make sure that I, sound as uh, smart and pithy as you make me sound on Geek's Guide. Otherwise, I'm going to damage our brand. Do you, uh, do you do any editing anymore? I mean, what's your workflow like for that? I don't do a ton of editing now, but I do. I sometimes have long pauses while I'm trying to think about what to say, and I'll edit those out. And if I start going down a conversation path that I'm not happy with, I'll just make a note to myself to edit that out. But I'm I do, especially since I'm producing my own stuff again, I do minimal editing because honestly, it takes a long time to edit the show well. And like I said, I don't have that right now. So I'm having to go raw again, like the old days. But um, I do offer to edit my interviews if people, or if I ask a question they're not comfortable with or they... Uh, start talking about something and realize they probably shouldn't or don't want to. But um, I usually don't edit for brevity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, uh, we, we do, but it takes an insane amount of time. <laughs> and I don't think most people really appreciate that. But when you just think about it, if it's a two and a half hour long podcast, just listening to it and not even changing anything, just listening to it takes two and a half yeah. hours. You, so you can imagine listening to it you know, 10 times and oh, making yeah. changes every couple of seconds, how, just well, how the hours add up. Well, you know, sometimes I wonder how you do it because a lot of times in my conversations, the questions I ask will be based on whatever they just said. And there have been times when I thought, ah, well, either the interviewee rambled or I rambled, I should cut this part out. And I cut that part out. And then I realized the next thing that we talk about, if we didn't have that first part in there, you don't know, you don't have no segue. Mm hmm yeah, sometimes we just have no segue, which some people complain bitterly about. But I, I saw, I, I, it's like always a trade off. It's like, is it worth getting rid of five minutes of stuff that didn't go anywhere? If, if the, and the cost is the sort of awkward transition. And I, I usually feel, I often feel that it is. But if some, some things, and I'll, I'll like move stuff around and I'll, sometimes I'll even go back and re record it. Like a lot of times I'll ask a question and the person's answer has nothing to do with <laughs> what I actually asked. <laughs> and I'll actually go back and re record a question that is actually, relevant to what their answer was. And so like, you know, I, I try to fix really messy transitions as much as I can, sometimes even by re-recording re a question to, to fill in that, you know, to make that transition. I, I think it's funny that people complain about the awkwardness on the podcast sometimes. It's like, come on, we're the geeks, guys, the galaxy. <laughs> we're geeks. Of course we're awkward. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I guess just, I'm kind of curious, just what is your... Just kind of what kind of equipment do you use and what's your, I guess I'll just describe our, our process really quickly. And I say this as much for people to suggest ways we could do it better as anything else. But 
Uh, John and I both, we have uh, blue, I guess we, we both started out using blue snowball mics. I now have a blue Yeti. They're USB bikes. We record using Skype. Hopefully my version is just good enough that I can just use that. But sometimes I have to take some of John's audio if, uh, you know, if it sounds better in certain parts. I put it, I edit in Audacity. Uh, I, you know, do noise removal. So you highlight a part where nobody's saying anything and get a sample of that noise and then subtract that out from the whole thing. I run it through Levelator, which makes the volume more uh, uniform throughout. Uh, I use the fade in and fade out functions a lot. When I, if, if you have to cut something, um, so say I, I cut the first sentence of somebody's answer, then I, you can sort of have to fade it in to make it sound like they're just starting talking. Uh, a lot of times the first thing somebody says is louder than the rest of it, so you have to amplify it up a little bit to make it sound like they just started that sentence. And one of the biggest thing that's, that's such a help is in, in Audacity, if you hit the Z key, if you highlight a, a section of, of the waveform and hit the Z key, it moves the edges of it to the nearest place where it crosses the X axis. So in effect, the places, the nearest places where it's silent. And so you can use that to make clean cuts. And so if you have somebody who says, for example, but, 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 you can put it through the first half of the first but, you know, halfway through the first but and halfway through the last but, hit the Z key and hit delete. And almost all the time, it just it turns it into one but. You can get rid of that kind of verbal stumbling. I record either on my... Uh my rig in the guest room, which is where I am now, um, with my Studio Projects B1 mic. I've got a small Eurorack mixer that plugs into my computer, or I record on my H2, Zoom H2, and I really, really enjoy that because it's got very good quality for a, a handheld digital recorder. And then I use... Amadeus Pro because I loved Audacity, but I was not happy with the fact that it kept crashing on the Mac. And so I found Amadeus Pro, which was affordable and had was very much like Audacity, so the learning curve wasn't very high. The current version of Audacity is pretty good, but the old version, it crashed literally every eight minutes or so. It was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah that's why I lost my patience for it and upgraded. So... um I do a lot of what you do. I don't do noise removal simply because every time I do it, it sounds like I'm talking from a tin can. So I haven't found a proper way to remove the noise without making it sound like crap. But I do normalize and I use Levelator from time to time. And I host with Libsyn. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it for me. So why do you use a mixer? What's the advantage of that? Uh, because my mic doesn't plug into the computer. Is I don't have a USB mic. That's the only that doesn't help you do I, the volumes well, or something. I mean, I, there's. I don't fiddle with anything. I I wanted a good mic, and my choices. This <laughs> we're talking back in the olden days before the really good USB mics came out, and so oh, that's right. That's what happened. Uh, the guys from the Dragon Page sold me their old MXL nine ninety mics. And those were the kind that need to plug into the mixer. So I had to get a mixer to plug into, and I just got the smallest one out there. I found a proper level, and I don't mess with any of the other knobs. And so then when I wanted to upgrade my mic, I decided to stick with one that was... <laughs> see, you can see I'm self-taught, because all I can call this mic is non-USB. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it has a real name, but I don't know what it is right now. Uh, I would just add for the Geek's Guide process, uh, for, on, on my end, I actually I have a little closet studio now. Uh, I recently moved like in August of last year, and, and, and I have uh, my own office here. And, uh, and so in my office, there's a closet because it's just a bedroom. And so I, I just have a little uh, room set up in my closet, and that way I can close the door. I can put some blankets on the walls to help absorb the sound. And uh, that way, hopefully, it'll keep out most of the outside noise, so like dogs barking and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, that's been pretty cool. And also, I, I started recording standing up because I, uh, I went on book tour recently and I felt like when I was standing at a podium, uh, I felt much more confident and I felt like I was speaking better and I was less awkward. And uh, so, but I, I now I have a little standing desk in my uh, in my closet here. So uh, that's how that's how I record. Yeah, I guess I forgot to mention, too, that the software we use to record 
like something always goes wrong with audio recording. <laughs> so we have it's like so many redundant systems here, but I use Call Recorder, Audio Hijack Pro, and Wiretap Studio to record different mm -hmm. things. All at the same time? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and I and on my end, I also record everything. And so I record using Wiretap, uh, Audacity, and Call Recorder. And so and and each all three of them do something else too. So like Call Recorder records everything. It called it records both sides of the Skype conversation and my audio. On Audacity, it records just my audio. And then wiretap, I have recording just Skype, so just the Skype call, but not my audio. And uh, so it's so Dave has every possible option in case anything goes wrong. And yeah, and one of the liabilities of using Skype is that Skype tries to figure out who's talking and silence everybody else. Uh, so if you if say I laugh loudly while John's talking, sometimes it'll just totally cut out what he's saying. And so it's always good to have you know as many different recordings from as many different people as possible. Sure. And then we just have ourselves listed on um, iTunes and then Stitcher. I got us listed on. Do you have, is there anything else that you use that for like people to find your podcasts? No, I use uh, iTunes and I used to use Stitcher, but I remember there was something in there, uh, terms and conditions that I didn't like. That made some of my listeners mad, but of course now I can't remember exactly what it was. And I remember the olden days of there were so many podcast networks. There needed to be somebody joked about starting a network to list all the podcast <laughs> networks. But there was Podcast Alley where you could vote for your favorite podcasts and people would end each podcast with, don't forget to vote for us on Podcast Alley. And then Podcast Pickle. And uh, I kind of miss those because, you know, it's, it's good to have a variety. iTunes is the behemoth. Well, I guess one of the things I wanted to talk about is what are the, I mean, when you started, right, it was pretty much all hobbyists and amateurs. And I, I imagine it was a lot easier to get listeners if you were just somebody podcasting from your garage. Exactly. Um, but if you look at the podcast, the top podcasts on iTunes, like the top 200 are almost all corporations or entertainment professionals. And yeah. so is podcasting still a good way for somebody breaking in to get noticed? I struggle with how I feel about that because on one hand, it legitimized podcasting. It gave us credibility, finally. But as you said, suddenly everyone knows that you can listen to NPR podcasts. And so all of NPR's, well, not all of NPR's listeners, but many of NPR's listeners, more than I have, go to iTunes and, and subscribe to them all. And um, yeah, it does push the indie podcaster down. It was easy when there were only I, I thought I thought I was getting in late because there were already a thousand podcasts when I got in. But now I'm thinking, wow, I was one of the first thousand podcasts. That's, mm -hmm. that's pretty small. So um, I think you have to go at it from a different angle now if, if I were getting started, because you can't copy what other people are doing exactly, because why would anybody pay attention to you if you did? So you need to have a different angle or you need to have uh, something different to talk about. Or uh, I remember several years ago when there was a podcast dedicated to the Mini Cooper. And I think they did get sponsorship from uh, BMW because they were so focused on the Mini. Yeah, like you're saying, if you find some specific thing that already has a big following and do a podcast specifically about that, it seems like you can become really popular really quick. Uh, like some of the Game of Thrones podcasts, which are just produced by fans, have become super, super popular, super, right. super fast. And so if I were just starting out now, I would try to do something like that, where either, I mean, if you're like the ninth Game of Thrones podcast, it's probably, you know, there's a lot of diminishing returns. But if you can get in early and be the first one, you know, for a, a show like that, that really gets popular, um, it seems like that's a good way in. Or do something like like niche, like, um, like the HP Lovecraft podcast or... Um, you know, the Tolkien professor or something where it's something that has a big, a lot of, you know, has a lot of fans, but there's not a podcast currently serving it. it you know, the, the world is not fair that there is no, uh, there is no Game of Thrones podcast hosted by you and Douglas Cohen, you know, <laughs> who is, who's been on our show before. Uh, but I mean, you guys know so much about Game of Thrones. Like I can't even understand it. 
you guys should totally have a Game of Thrones podcast. But like you say, I mean, it's too late now. It's like you, you, you needed to do it before the show even started you, when it was just a book series. Well, and it's like there are, a lot, there are actually a lot of other podcasts I'd be interested in doing, but this one takes up every waking <laughs> hour that I have. So, I mean, you know, I have no time to do another one. But uh yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I was going to say, though, um, in relation to what Mur was saying about uh, about all these corporate podcasts sort of making it harder for any podcast to find listeners. Uh, I, I understand what you're saying there, and, I, and, and that's probably true to a large extent. But um, I also I was reading uh, Kickstarter actually recently just posted an article. Uh, it was specifically about a lot of people who were complaining about the Veronica Mars Kickstarter and the, the Zach Braff uh, Kickstarter. And so, like, because these are established uh, Hollywood people who are using Kickstarter to fund things. And so a lot of people were complaining about that because they were saying, well, what do those people need Kickstarter for? This is supposed to be for indie artists. And um, what kick the Kickstarter people were saying is that, well, actually what happens is those Kickstarters brought in so many new people to Kickstarter that had never previously backed a Kickstarter. And a lot of those same people have gone on to then back many other Kickstarters. And so I wonder how much of these, how much that these corporate type podcasts actually do ring in listeners and get people hooked on podcasting and then send them off in search of other podcasts that are things that they might like. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, we, people used to say that the, the podcast authors were competing with each other and were just like, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. You know, when Scott Sigler got popular, the rest of us got a little bit more popular because his listeners were like, okay, what other good fiction is out there that's for free for podcasts? So um, you definitely have a point there. Yeah. And actually, speaking of Scott, um, you know, both you and Scott sort of got started by podcasting your novels, you know, sort of serializing them um, as the podcast. Uh, is anybody still doing that? I mean, are there new are there new people you know, still coming up and uh, through podcasting, doing that and, and making any waves or. I'm not entirely sure, actually. I am embarrassingly a little bit away from the patio book community, but I know patio books is still alive and doing quite well. So I know they're, they've got to have new books uploaded all the time. I don't know anybody who has, you know, furthered their career or, or built a career starting with a podcast yet, unless they've moved on to uh, e-publishing. I know a couple of podcasters who've moved on to make some good money on Amazon, but uh, I, I don't know if anybody's done it from patio books in the past couple of years. Do you know anything? There's this podcast um, on iTunes called We're Alive. It's this full cast audio zombie thing that just seems to be insanely popular. Uh, if you look at the top episodes, it's actually kind of pisses me off. But if you look at the top ep <laughs> episodes in the literature category, like 80 out of the 100 are just episodes of this one podcast, which makes oh, wow. the which makes the list kind of, you know, not all that useful. But uh, it has, I don't know, has thousands of reviews on iTunes. Uh, I'm just wondering if does anyone know anything about it <laughs> uh, other than what I just described? I actually don't. I, I have not heard it. So uh, I'm checking out iTunes right now. So. I want to see this. Yeah, this is the first I've heard of it. I mean, is uh, is are there famous people associated with it, or I'm I'm just kind of curious how it could have gotten that popular with uh, you know, if it was just the sort of unknown people doing it. I don't know. It's it's it seems to be very professionally produced, but I don't know that there are any stars or anything associated with it. Not that I know of. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, zombies are still pretty popular. I mean, you know, uh, actually, my uh, my wife. Uh, when when we first met, um, she was telling me how zombies were on their way out, and this was like uh, when I was actually we met at the World Fantasy Convention, and and I was I was nominated for the World Fantasy Award for my anthology, The Living Dead, and she didn't know that, and so she was sort of talking hmm. about how zombies were on their way out, and it's like, and so we laugh about that now, but um, and and she still keep and she still occasionally she'll say like, oh well, I think they're finally you know on their way out, and I'm like, but you know, The Walking Dead's like the most popular show on TV, you know, so. Um, and then the World War Z is coming out as a movie, and I mean, which actually I'm really dubious about, but that's a different conversation. Uh, but yeah. you know, yeah, I mean, um, it is interesting though that like one of the most popular things in iTunes as a podcast is a zombie thing. Well, I guess Mur, I mean, I, I've been saying that really the only way I have to judge the popularity of podcasts is how many reviews they have on iTunes. What do you think about that uh, methodology? And um, like what what the heck do the iTunes rankings mean anyway? Like what 
how do, how, how do you get a higher ranking? What does your ranking mean? Do you oh, have good any Lord. No idea. <laughs> idea no idea. I think they're as uh, magical and secretive as Amazon. We've been trying to figure that out for years, ever since the beginning of when iTunes launched their podcast support, trying to figure out how they choose what goes on the pages or what's popular or whatever. But I, I have no idea. I heard you say once that you thought it was some combination of new subscribers, downloads, and positive reviews within the last week. Did I say that? I oh, thought, wow. I thought so. I thought it was... I, some <laughs> that sounds the, really smart. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, well, because I wonder, because our show is every other week, and I wonder if that hurts us in the rankings, if it's you know tracking what kind of activity have you had just in the past week, if we would do better splitting up the episodes and having something come out every week, if we would have a higher ranking. But I just mm-hmm. don't, I just don't know. I don't know. I think, I think more frequent is better for people. Um, I personally get deluged. I don't like too many frequent podcasts, but I, I, I think I'm in the minority there. Actually, that would be a really interesting experiment. And that's maybe something that we could ask our listeners to weigh in on. Um, but I mean, that would actually be interesting. Cause I mean, there's nothing stopping us from actually having like part A and part B of an episode, you know, even if it's technically two episodes, but like, as far as our format goes, it's like, well, the interview is basically completely separate from the panel discussion. I mean, a lot of the time the panel is sort of related to the interview, but I mean, not to the extent that you have to listen to the interview first in order to make the panel make sense. And of course, the interview is going to stand on its own. Uh, We'd have to, we'd have to discuss that with Wired, obviously, but I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. I wonder if people would like that more or if they would like it uh, less or, or what. I guess just, uh, are there any other podcasts you guys want to mention before we move on? I had a couple. Just, okay, yeah, just a couple of the other science fiction podcasts that I've, I've spent quite a bit of time listening to and I want to mention uh, are, the, say, The Functional Nerds, The Agony Column that Rick Kleppel does. Speaking of like putting out lots of, I mean, this is one of the things that has over a thousand uh, episodes. Uh, and there's also the 5x5 Five Five podcast network. Uh, and they have a show on there called The Incomparable that I think is really one of the best science fiction podcasts. It's a bunch of the editors of Macworld magazine. And they, they talk a lot about books. They talk a lot about movies. They actually have sort of a book club kind of format a lot where they're all five of them or whatever. will all read the same book and then they'll talk about it. Uh, and then Nerdist Industries, even if you don't listen to the, the Nerdist podcast, they have um, they have a new Star Trek one called The Mission Log. And I think the Nerdist Writers Panel is probably worth checking out. They have interviews. This, each each episode is a panel discussion with professional TV writers. Can I ask you guys a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, what do you think of how Worldcon has approached the fan cast category? <laughs> Actually, I, I kind of have a plan in my head to like rework the entire Hugo category system just because like so much of it is there's there's troubling things or stupid things about so many different categories. But the fan cast one is definitely weird because basically like Geek Sky is not eligible for that because we actually do get paid by Wired. So like then what category are we competing in? So it's like we have to compete in the best related work category. And it's like, well, that's kind of weird. I mean, that's where writing excuses has been nominated. And so that's fine. Yeah. But it's just like kind of a weird thing. And so like, for instance, like I know with Escape Pod, it's like, well, what category do you nominate Escape Pod in? Do you nominate it for best semi prosine? Is it a professional magazine? So do you have to nominate the editor for best professional editor? It's it's all very confusing, and the rules don't really help very much. It's like if you're just going to have a category for podcasting, fine, but I don't understand why it's got to be a fan podcast in right. order to qualify for the award. It, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and and just people are constantly nominating us in the fan cast category, and you know, <laughs> it's just really frustrating on online where people are like, "Hey, I nominated you for best fan cast." We're like, "Oh, actually, we're not eligible for that." But it it just goes to show you how confusing it is. Well, I mean, I think I think largely it was created in order to keep fanzine separate from fan cast because Starship Sofa had come in and got nominated and then and then it won. Um, and I think the hardcore fanzine proponents, you know, the people who have been in Worldcon for years and they just love their fanzines. You know, they wanted a separate category for the podcast because, well, I mean, in, in their defense, it's, it is a different thing. Um, but I can see them wanting to have a, a category for that to be uh, competing in that's not fanzine. But, yeah, I just don't think that the solution they came up with was really ideal. Yeah, that's pretty much my thought. I you were asking about Escape Pod. Escape Pod did fit all the criteria of semi prosine. Well, not mm-hmm. all of them, but mm-hmm. some of but enough. That's because you only need to do a certain amount, not the whole list. But um, 
I agree that if they just said podcast, it would be a little bit better because then people wouldn't be confused. Because I wonder, uh, I, I know that the numbers are there and honestly, I don't want to look them up because I probably will be disappointed. <laughs> but I wonder what uh, podcast may have gotten nominated for fan cast and best related work and therefore the votes were split so they didn't get either. Mm hmm. Or semi prosine fan cast and best related work. You know, I, I, it's one of those things that can be in so many different. I mean, let's say you really, really like the podcast of a novel. James Patrick Kelly won a Nebula for the podcast of Burn. Specifically, they said it was for the podcast, not the book he put out. I can't see that happening for in the Hugo world. Yeah, although um, that Metatropolis actually did get nominated for a Hugo, and that was an audio audio only anthology at the time it, it's since come out in print but um i think what was it nominated for best uh best dramatic presentation or something which oh, is yeah which is typically a movie category uh which is also weird i mean it obviously it is a dramatic presentation and that's part of the reason they have such a weird description of the category even though it's obviously the movie category on the other hand, they're also nominating whole series of TV shows in that category now. So um, it's all very confusing. And I mean, honestly, like if <laughs> I don't know how many people who, who are listening to this actually have ever nominated things for the Hugos. It's so much work. I mean, not to dissuade people from doing it, because I think it's actually, you know, it's fun as a geek to do it because, you know, you want your voice to be heard. And the Hugos are like this influential thing in the industry. And it's like so many legends have won these things. And it's a cool thing to be a part of. But. Man, it's a lot of work. And it's like, I mean, even even if you're not going to vote in every category, it's like just to figure out what the hell is eligible. It's like a lot of work. And I mean, um, Locus and um, there's some other sites that try to help people figure out what's eligible and they make their recommendations and stuff. But man, even with all that and even being a 100 percent, you know, full time science fiction professional, you know, it's hard for me even so. Um, I can't imagine what it just a regular fan um, is encountered with when they uh, when they have to try to do this on their own. Yeah. All right, cool. So I guess one uh, recent news story related to podcasting I wanted to bring up is this patent troll attack. Timur, have you been following this at all? Yeah, I've been I've been aware of it. I've been following the EFF discussion on it and kind of waiting for my own little attack to come. It hasn't yet. Thank goodness. Yeah. Okay. So I guess I'll just explain the situation is that, uh, you know, patent trolls are people who they, they just patent and anything they can think of with these really vague descriptions of something that they think might happen. And the patent office is like totally overworked and they just rubber stamp a lot of this stuff. And so they approve all these stupid patents and then the patent trolls never make any products. They just uh, wait for somebody else to do something and then they sue them. And it's, it's, it's essentially extortion, right? They say, uh, you know, pay me some amount of money or else I'll take you to court. And in court, I guess just defending yourself against a, a patent claim costs millions of dollars. So even if you win, you're bankrupt. And so they can just extort people over and over and over again. And I guess there's one district in East Texas where the judge is really friendly to patent trolls. And so every patent troll files their case in this particular district. And these people who are targeting podcasting now, they claim they like own a patent on just the concept of podcasting, but they actually successfully sued Apple, uh, claiming that they <laughs> own the patent on the, the concept of an iPod. Uh, and so it's just very scary that, you know, even a company as large and wealthy and powerful as Apple can't defend themselves just against this sort of thing. Uh, these patent trolls, they're actually suing Adam Carolla, and they've sent threatening letters to a bunch of other people, including Mark Marin, Jesse Thorne, the How Stuff Works people, and a bunch of other people. Oh, oh, and, and as Mer was saying, the the, EF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, Corey Doctorow was associated with them, has been associated with them for a long time. We had him as a guest recently, have uh, kind of agreed to help provide legal uh, defense or legal uh, advice for podcasters in this and are encouraging anyone who gets one of these threatening letters to contact them so they know what's going on. And there is some action in Congress to try to, there's something called the Shield Act, which is going to try to make it so that if a patent troll sues you and you win, they have to pay your legal fees. And uh, so that would at least provide some 
disincentive for them to just file these frivolous lawsuits wantonly. Uh, so everyone should uh, go to the EFF website and look up this patent troll thing and send an email. They, have, they make it really easy to send an email to your congressman to tell them to support the SHIELD Act. But it's not going to be an easy thing to solve, it seems. And uh, Jesse Thorne, who does the, the Bullseye podcast, he's, he says this is an existential threat to podcasting. I mean, it really could, it seems, just kill podcasting dead. Because to do a podcast, you, could, you would have to pay a huge licensing fee to these people. And most podcasts don't, you know, 99% of podcasts make no money whatsoever. So it would kill 99% of podcasts probably right off the bat if uh, nothing is done about this. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm watching EFF and uh, need to do the, the writing into the congressman thing. But um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm so baffled that this could actually happen. I'm not scared yet. And I probably should be. But... I have a little bit too much faith in the law, I suppose, or common sense. I have too much faith in common sense. And I just have faith that common sense will prevail, and clearly it doesn't all the time. <laughs> I guess just another uh, story maybe we should mention in the podcasting world is uh, our uh, guest from Episode 5, Brian Dunning of the Skeptoid Podcast, just pled guilty to wire fraud in a cookie-stuffing scheme. And I'm a little vague on the details, but according to news reports, it seems that what he did was uh, s <laughs> write a piece of a free software, an app that you could download that would tell you where people, where visitors to your website were coming from. And this would secretly signal, uh, it would set a cookie uh, on your computer so that when you bought anything from eBay, eBay would think that you would come to eBay from an affiliate link of his when actually you hadn't. And apparently he made millions of dollars doing this. Uh, another guy was doing the same thing and made apparently $35 million doing this. And they're both looking now at 20 years in jail. And uh, I feel, I, I mean, I, and I, I gave him $25, you know, for his podcast. And I feel a little like that was kind of pointless now. <laughs> and I guess that's kind of what I'm most upset about is that I'm afraid people are going to think like, oh, I gave money to this podcast and he was actually making millions of dollars <laughs> with a cooking stuffing scheme on the side and I'm not giving any more money to podcasters. So I just want to assure people that not all of us are making millions of dollars. Yeah. Yeah, Dave is definitely working a full-time job editing this podcast and, and, and whatnot. And uh, yeah, <laughs> not getting paid a very good hourly wage. I can vouch for that. Yep, same here. It's uh, There's no no cookies, no <laughs> no uh, rolling in the dough here. So you can count on us not to betray you and put stuff on your website. <laughs> Unless you guys are doing something else shady with cookies. <laughs> not that I'm saying you are. No, I, I guarantee that our uh, all our activities are 100% cookie free. <laughs> Uh, actually, Murr, you mentioned that you're doing, you have um, premium content with your, mm -hmm. I should be writing. Just how is, how is that going? Do you think that's a um, feasible way for podcasters to make a little money on the side? I think it is a little bit, a little bit of money. Um, my listeners are very patient because sometimes I'm not able to put out premium content. And a lot of them just say, I'm supporting the show that's, that I've liked for years. So it's not a big deal. I have run into several problems with just the way I do it. My WordPress sites got so big, and once I installed the membership plugins, the strain on the server was too much, and I could not figure out how to make it better. And finally, I scrapped all of it and uh, started the site from scratch and moved everything over to a Google Plus community that was locked and gave all of my members access to those places. And so what I produce for them isn't even a podcast anymore. It's put out via the Google Group's mailing list. But it, it's still sorry, it, it's still a podcast in the term in the sense that it's an audio file. It's just not on an RSS feed. Is that what you're saying? Right, right. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm a purist. I do believe <laughs> that a podcast has to have an RSS feed because audio was around for years and years and years and it wasn't a podcast until you got the RSS feed and the enclosure tag. Mm -hmm. But that's my high horse I will not get on. <laughs> 
But it's like a private group with an archive yes. of audio files you can download, right? Exactly. And I spent a couple hundred dollars over the couple of years I've done this on plugins that just didn't quite do what I needed it to do. And so it's been frustrating on the administrative level. And, um, you know, I have that feeling that, well, if I was a corporate podcaster, I would probably have a team that could help me with this. And, but no, it's just me. So I've been uh, struggling with it. And, and the Google group seems to be working. No one's complained. And they actually like having a place on the Google Plus community to talk. So at least I've given them a private forum area to hang out in. But back to the, the actual premium, you know, I, I charge $3 a month or $33 a year or $150 for lifetime. I have like four people who paid for the lifetime subscription. That that was pretty awesome. And and I, I don't think that's too much. No one's actually one person has complained that that I was not thinking about the poor people. And um so I invited him to not listen to any of my content if he if it was too expensive. But it's it's uh it's not paying my bills but it's money that I would miss if I stopped doing it, mm. if that makes sense. So, yeah. um, and, and, you know, a lot of people just are happy to support me and that really makes me feel good. It makes me want to keep doing it. Uh -huh. Yeah. Cause I, I, I wonder sometimes if we should try to do some sort of premium content and I couldn't do anything extra. Cause like I said, you know, I'm spending every waking hour I already have just to do what we're already doing. But I do think sometimes when we have these, two and a half hour long episodes like, oh, maybe I can make one hour of this premium content or something and people would still be getting like tons of free stuff. But it's kind of like once I put that much work into it, I want as many people to listen to it as possible. Yeah. And so even if even if a, a, a hardcore, a small hardcore fan base were paying extra for that, I feel like I'd still be like, oh, but I want more people to listen to it, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that that is a problem. But it seems like I wonder, will iTunes ever make it possible for you to sell podcast episodes the way that you can sell songs, do you think? I don't know. Because I, mean, I that really would, don't. That would be ideal from my point of view where, I mean, you could either sell the, sell the episodes for 20 cents or you know, something like really cheap, but that if people listen to tons and tons of episodes, it would be a you know, reasonable amount of money. Or just make every fifth episode two bucks or something and then... You know, people could listen to almost all of them for free. And then if they're like a hardcore fan, they can buy the extra episodes, stuff like that. I mean, but it seems like making giving people the option to pay at, on the iTunes store is the only way it's ever going to generate any kind of significant income. Because just the um, inconvenience of going to the website and going through PayPal and all that stuff, it just seems like it's going to discourage virtually everybody. It just seems like since iTunes or since Apple has set up the iBook store. Uh, and, you know, ebook publishing has taken off the way it has. It just seems like it's a natural step for them to try to also monetize this. And although, to be fair, they haven't actually really made the music store open to indie artists the way ebook stores have been made open to indie artists. As far as I know, iTunes and like Amazon MP3 and whatnot, like they don't have those mechanisms for indie bands to do that. And so it is interesting how audio hasn't uh, hasn't been made uh, available in the to the DIY crowd the same way books have. All right, cool. So, I mean, we should probably start wrapping up the podcast discussion. Um, I guess just, um, or before we let you go, why don't you talk a little bit about your new book, The um, Shambling Guide to New York City. Uh, just tell us, what's that about? Well, it's kind of a humorous urban fantasy. I have a human who goes to New York and discovers that monsters not only exist, but are in need of a lot of the same things humans are, such as if they like to go to another city, they're going to need a travel guide. And she is an editor looking for a job, and she finds this publishing company for monsters and uh, turns out to be quite qualified. And chaos ensues after that. But um, it was just a... a idea I had after I did some RPG work for a charity that benefited the uh, Hurricane Katrina victims. I was just writing flavor text if you wanted to run a campaign in New Orleans and just decided I didn't want a normal tour guide. I wanted a zombie tour guide. So who needed a zombie tour guide? Well, other zombies. So um, I've been thinking about this travel thing and obviously big fan of Douglas Adams. Yeah, us too, strangely enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, 
it's a fun book. It's getting good reviews so far. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned, I think it's been a, had a couple of uh, starred reviews, right? And Publishers Weekly and a couple other places? Uh, not Publishers Weekly, but almost every other place. <laughs> God damn, <laughs> Publishers Weekly. <laughs> <laughs> no, Publishers Weekly was positive. They just didn't star it. I got a star from Library Journal and, and Book List. And one other one, Kirkus Reviews. Kirkus is pretty stingy with their stars, so that's uh, really something to crow about. That's what I've heard. I was I was pretty excited. Um, and you mentioned the podcast will be available for a limited time. Should people should go download that now, or how do they find that? Uh, it'll be at merverse.com. The whole podcast will be there from the beginning to end for a month after I end it. So sometime in December, it'll be going away. But until from now till December, you'll be able to get the podcast week by week. It, and I released episode two today. Okay, cool. And you mentioned there's going to be a sequel? Yes, the sequel is called The Ghost Train to New Orleans. And uh, it is similar plot where they're going to do a travel guide in New Orleans and chaos ensues. So um, that'll be out March 4th, I believe. All right, cool. So I think we're going to wrap things up there. So Murr, thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. It was fun. And thanks again to Rick Yancey for being our guest today. Big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including Just Some A-Hole, that's this person's screen name, not an editorial comment, and Sneaky Kitten, who writes, What can I say? I'm addicted to podcasts. No, really. I'm signed up to 42 different shows with a backlog of 187 episodes. My friends have an intervention in the works. But Geek's Guide has to be among my top five favorite podcasts. Every time they update, I set aside any other shows I was intending to listen to and immediately update my iPod so I can listen to the latest episode. So thank you, Sneaky Kitten. I think you should change your name to Awesome Kitten. And big thanks as well to Brett Beeching, Brian Carroll, and Anton Markt for becoming subscribers number 48, 49, and 50. To see a list of all our subscribers, visit our website at geeksguideshow.com and click on subscribe. All right, so that was our show. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your hosts, visit johnjosephadams.com or davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by Slipgate 9 Entertainment. If you enjoyed this program... Tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.